Greetings. I'm Tim Cruz, soil ecologist and director of research at the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas. It is a pleasure to lead off the virtual workshop series on catalyzing adaptive and resilient food systems. Our first workshop today focuses on adaptation and mitigation synergies in agriculture. And I'm going to start by asking, where might we find really effective and viable adaptation and mitigation strategies for climate change that are broadly applicable here in the US and around the world. The topic of how management of agricultural lands might be improved so as to help draw down atmospheric CO2 on the one hand and increase crop resilience to climate change on the other has received a great deal of attention in recent years, both within the scientific community and in the public sphere. Countless research papers and many of them very compelling, have been written on how new emphases in plant breeding or the addition of novel soil amendments such as biochar or ground rock dust can improve on climate change mitigation and possibly adaptation. At the same time, there's been growing interest among the public in how adoption of what is increasingly be called regenerative farming practices can achieve climate mitigation and adaptation goals. There are many groups working today to, pro to promote regenerative agriculture. Some are quite rigorous with scientific evidence, while others make claims that the scientific literature does not necessarily uphold. The recently released paper by the Rodale Institute and Carbon Underground on regenerative agriculture and the soil carbon solution makes the claim that Global adoption of regenerative practices across both grasslands and arable acreage could sequester more than 100% of current anthropogenic emissions of CO2, and that stable soil carbon can be built quickly enough to result in a rapid drawdown of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Last week in the online publication Civil Eats, Virginia Gwynn interviewed several prominent soil carbon researchers to hear their reaction to this updated Rodale white paper. And there was pretty consistent frustration voiced about what I refer to as carbon exuberance. For example, John Foley, formerly the director of the California Academy of Sciences, and now the executive director of Project Drawdown, said, Regenerative agriculture is a powerful drawdown, both to reduce emissions and add new carbon sinks. But preposterous claims that are easily debunked only undermine the message that regenerative agriculture is one of the few areas that can potentially solve around 10% of climate change. Does the fact that overzealous claims are made by some soil carbon enthusiasts somehow mean we should reject the idea of regenerative agriculture as a whole? Well, the quote from John Foley suggests he doesn't think so, and neither do I. The claims just need to be better calibrated. The term regenerative points us towards some very important solutions in addressing soil degradation, fossil fuel dependence, and other common ecosystem disservices that result from mainstream farming practices. You see, the soils we farm were formed under a diverse perennial vegetation of natural ecosystems. Take this grassland soil, a mollusol in Kansas or a chernozem in other parts of the world. This soil is the product of perennial grasses and forbs investing over 50% of their annual productivity below ground for centuries to millennia. Plants making investments in coarse roots and fine roots which release carbon-rich exudates and host mycorrhizal fungi, fungi that grow hyphae beyond the reach of most fine roots and produce the sticky organic molecule glomalin that helps to bind stable soil aggregates. The totality of these organic inputs from plant roots, exudates, mycorrhizae, feed an extraordinarily brilliant food web of soil organisms, from bacteria and fungi to algae and nematodes to springtails and earthworms. Populations of soil creatures explode under the right conditions and trophic groups gobble up other trophic groups, resulting in a matrix of dead and decomposing bodies or so-called necromass. This mollusol was developed by the activities of a soil organism community 
but is fed by the photosynthetic products of deep-rooted perennial vegetation. But grassland soils are not unique in this respect. Soils of temperate deciduous forests, coniferous forests, tropical rainforests, savannas, deserts, also form under the influence of diverse perennial vegetation. And it is the soil capital developed in these ecosystems that has supported and been exploited by the annual crop agriculture that has fed most of humanity since the early Neolithic. In contrast to the ecosystems that built the planet's soils, the dominant food producing ecosystem that humans rely on is based on a relatively small number of annual plants. Cereals like corn, wheat, rice, barley, sorghum, oats, as well as legume pulses like beans, peas, lentils, and others are all annuals. And growing annuals requires rather extreme regular disturbances in order to eliminate competing vegetation to give the little seedlings a chance to establish. We know now that plowing and other types of tillage disturbances result in soil erosion. Iowa is still losing a pound of soil for every pound of corn produced. But tillage also results in loss of soil organic matter or soil carbon. And here's why. When a soil is first plowed, aggregates or chunks of soil are broken open. And what was physically and chemically protected soil organic matter is exposed to microbial attack. The microbes chow down and metabolize this organic matter, breathing out carbon dioxide. So losses of soil carbon via microbial respiration go up following tillage conversion to agriculture. At the same time soil carbon losses go up, soil carbon inputs from roots go down. Roots are the most important source of carbon inputs for the formation of soil organic matter. Temperate grassland vegetation allocates on the order of 40 to 70% of total productivity below ground, whereas annual grains allocate only 15 to 25%. When you combine reduced soil carbon inputs by replacing perennial roots with annual roots, with increased soil carbon losses induced by tillage, total soil organic carbon contents decline almost universally in agricultural soils. The two soils in this figure by Schlesinger pretty much bracket the range of soil carbon loss in the decades following agricultural conversion. The x-axis is years of cultivation since conversion, and the y-axis is percent of original soil organic carbon remaining. The Nebraska soil lost about 25% of soil organic carbon before leveling off in three decades, while the soil in Alberta lost closer to 60% over six decades. If there is any one denominator that defines the regenerative agricultural movement, it is the goal to modify farming practices in order to reverse this pattern. Regenerative agriculture focuses on ways for farmers and ranchers to build soil organic matter in order to improve soil health. There are a handful of common management actions that are shovel ready, so to speak, ready to be deployed now if the right educational outreach or incentives are offered. And we will hear more about incentives and farmer adoption from the next speakers of this session. Note that the two modes of action correspond to what I was discussing, discussing earlier. Practices that increase carbon inputs like improved crop rotations increased residues, cover crops, conversion to perennials, addition of compost or manure, or the improvement of grazing management, are efforts to counterbalance the soil organic matter loss due to reduced root inputs and harvest offtakes. On the other hand, actions that reduce sea losses, like conversion to perennials, no-till, rewetting peat or muck soils, focus on ways to reduce microbial respiration losses, mainly through reduced tillage. Note also that only one management practice that simultaneously increases sea inputs and reduces sea losses is on the chart. It is conversion to perennials. A similar conclusion can be drawn from this graphic that in one form or another is now appearing across the soil health universe. 
in this case on a USDA Natural Resource and Conservation Service initiative. The four approaches to achieving soil health are maximize continuous living roots, minimize disturbance, maximize biodiversity, and maximize soil cover. Now, if you grow annual grains like wheat, oats, pinot beans, sorghum, sunflower seeds, rice, corn, the options for achieving soil health become a complicated puzzle at best. Because the disturbance required to give an annual plant that starts from seed, the advantage it requires to produce becomes almost a magic trick with respect to these goals. Indeed, if you step back from the challenge of this puzzle and simply try to picture the ecosystem that would most simply capture these soil health principles, it would be the ecosystems that built the planet's soils in the first place. Perennial plant communities naturally achieve the soil health principles, maximize continuous living roots, minimize disturbance, maximize biodiversity, maximize soil cover. Extensive research has shown that when you convert croplands that have been under annual grains for decades with either perennial pasture mixes or perennial bioenergy crops, soils respond by recapturing the carbon that was lost after they were first plowed. In this review of mainly meta-analyses, we found the range of sequestration in annual perennial conversions to be between 330 and 1,888 kilograms of carbon per hectare per year. And these rates can continue for decades. This perennial pathway to a regenerative agriculture is incredibly compelling. But there's just one thing. All of our high yielding grain crops are annuals. Kernza breeder Lee DeHaan was responsible for this image of a laptop computer pieced together with outdated hardware. Simply put, we need new perennial crop hardware in agriculture to regenerate the soil health that nature has shown is possible. Geneticists and plant breeders at the Land Institute in collaboration with researchers around the world are taking two approaches to develop perennial grains. The first we call wide hybridization, which involves crossing already existing elite annual grain crops like wheat, sorghum, and rice with wild perennial cousins in order to bring perennialism into the annual. Our colleagues at Yunnan University in China have made exceptional progress in developing a perennial rice that yields close to annual rice over two harvests per year for six years, six harvests total thus far. The second approach being taken to develop perennial grain crops is to domesticate wild perennial plants through repeated cycles of selection and crossing, focusing on classic domestication traits like seed size, evenness of maturation and germination, as well as disease resistance and plant stature. By working to develop new crop species, we can intentionally choose plants that hold particular promise for climate change adaptation. Like the oil seed crop Silphium, a member of the sunflower family, which produces abundant seed while maintaining a root system that equips this crop to withstand extended periods of drought. Another new domestication project that some of you may have heard about is Kernza, a grain produced by intermediate wheatgrass. Kernza is the only grain we are working on that is being grown on farms, mainly in the Midwest and increasingly in Europe, but also by a group of researchers here at UC Davis. This photo is a below ground side by side comparison of Kernza and annual wheat. The contrast in root allocation is even clearer when the plants are grown in tubes so the roots can be cleaned of soil, with annual winter wheat occupying the left side of each of these seasonal snapshots. And for those of you who prefer graphs, these are root biomass data of wheat and Kernza roots measured by Christine Sprunger in her dissertation work at Michigan State University. Given the root system of Kernza, it may not be surprising to see that carbon does not accumulate that, that carbon does accumulate when this crop is planted following years of annual cropping. This figure depicts results from an eddy covariance tower 
that measured net ecosystem carbon accumulation in a Kernza field in Salina, Kansas from 2013 to 2016. The field had already been in Kernza for two years when the measurements started, and what we see are very substantial carbon gains, up to 5.7 tons per hectare per year in the first years of the study. This reflects a time when the Kernza plants themselves are growing in stature. Once the crop has reached full size above and below ground, then turnover and decomposition of roots and above ground biomass returns a larger and larger portion of a given year's carbon gains to the atmosphere as CO2. But there's good reason to believe that net ecosystem carbon accumulation will remain positive for quite some time as the soil sequester carbon in stable aggregates that is not vulnerable to microbial consumption and thus respiration. Indeed, this is what we found on a site with the same soil type as the eddy covariance study in a 16-year comparison of intermediate wheatgrass or kernza with an annual rotation of soy, sorghum, and wheat. The soil under the perennial grain accumulated about one ton of carbon per year more than the annual grains. While the new hardware of perennial crops or protocrops is under development, we are able to begin the exciting work of diversifying perennial cropping systems. There's a growing body of research that shows a positive relationship between plant community diversity and soil carbon accumulation. Adding a nitrogen fixing legume like alfalfa to a cereal like Kernza is an attractive first step, given that synthetic nitrogen fertilizer inputs represent the greatest fossil fuel input into crop production and nitrogen fertilizers are a root cause of elevated emissions of the potent greenhouse gas nitrous oxide. We have compared nitrous oxide emissions from Kernza plots that receive urea fertilizer with Kernza that is intercropped with alfalfa as a nitrogen source and have found some promising results. For two years, the Kernza alfalfa intercrop emitted significantly lower rates of nitrous oxide compared to the Kernza fertilized with urea and phosphate. This reduction of nitrous oxide emissions is one of the many ecosystem services that are predicted to regenerate as we move agriculture from a perturbed or disturbed ecosystem to one that functions more like a grassland or forest. In recent years, many people have started working on ways to change agriculture from a source to a sink of greenhouse gases while at the same time making it more resilient to climate change. Regenerative agriculture is a loosely defined umbrella movement that encompasses a wide range of practices purported to improve on soil organic matter and in turn soil health. In this talk, I've suggested that the most regenerative agriculture is one that is going to include essential features of the ecosystems that came before agriculture, the ecosystems that formed the soils that we currently farm. A natural systems inspired agriculture not only holds the greatest promise to regenerate soil carbon simply as a consequence of farming, but it is likely to improve on other critical ecosystem services as well. Thank you so much for your attention.